All right, folks, well, here we are. It's the Learn Pro Poker Study Group. So every month, uh, pre premium members here at Rec Poker get behind the scenes access to some of the great training uh, sites out there, Learn Pro Poker, Solve for Why, RedchipPokerCoaching.com, the MTT Poker Academy, just to name a few. And uh, so we have some of these study groups where every month we take a look at some of the behind the scenes uh, premium paywall material from these training sites that they choose to share with our Rec Poker premium members. So um, one of our first learning partners was uh, Learn Pro Poker with Ryan LaPlante. And so every month on the first day of the month, you can go to the Learning with Partners uh, tab on our video archive. And you can watch a new one hour training video produced just uh, from Learn Pro Poker. That's usually available just to paying Learn Pro Poker members. And they share that with our Rec Poker team every month. So this month was a uh, hand history review where Ryan LaPlante and Rob Gardner were going through a few hands um, from some live play of Ryan's. So this was a uh, live hand history review, like I was saying. Um, which is a great way to uh, sort of get inside the heads of the pros as they're making these decisions um, as they go through. So I took some notes as I was watching the video, and uh, there were a few things that I just wanted to kind of comment on and talk to you about, Keith. So one of the one of the spots was when he was holding pocket queens, and he'd opened. Uh, to a pretty standard sizing. I think this is off something like 30, 35 big blind stack or something like that. And he's facing a three bet from the blinds, from a fairly tight player. And he was deciding whether to fold or call or shove. And the way that Ryan was talking about it, it he talked about calling in spots like this because you can kind of play pretty straightforwardly depending on if there's a king or an ace on the flop. And that was something that I wanted to examine and talk to you about, Keith. So if you're if you're not holding a king or an ace, so if, if blockers aren't in play, then let's say you're holding pocket queens. There's about a 40% chance that the flop is going to come king or ace high. Mm -hmm. um, if you're holding pocket jacks, there's about a 50% chance that the flop's going to come ace, king, or queen high. If you've got tens, there's about, I think it's something like a 60% chance that the pot's going that the flop's going to come jack, queen, king, or ace high. So like obviously the higher your pair, the less likely it is that there'll be an overcard on the flop. And that all makes perfect sense if you think about it because there's just fewer cards available that are over cards. Um, so most of the time, if you're holding pocket queens, there's not going to be an ace or a king on the flop. And that obviously is a good flop for you to continue on. Um, so when I'm holding queens and I'm facing a three bet, I'm kind of thinking about all the hands that are in that player's three betting range and how I'm going to get money from the most money from that range. Right. And the way, and he talks about in the video about how if you four bet here, you're obviously always going to be behind aces and Kings and you're going to be ahead of Jacks and tens. And then you're kind of flipping with ace King. And if you put an opponent on that, range then he says specifically that it's true that you're going to get the max value out of jackson tens but when the flop does come an ace or a king you're just dead so often that it's uh he prefers to play it as a call and kind of play straightforwardly and that mm. just i mean ryan laplant knows a lot more about poker than i do but it just, I can't quite wrap my head around that a bit because, and I'm talking about specifically when we have pocket queens, because we're kind of letting our opponents 
play perfectly on the flop as well. That's the trade-off, right? So if we talk about the kind of hands that, because obviously aces and kings, it doesn't matter what's on the flop, right? Like, mm. I guess if if there's if he has kings, an ace might slow him down, but we're never bluffing on an ace anyway when we've got queens or very little anyway. So let's just pretend that aces and kings we're kind of always losing to. So the only other two parts of the range that we can compete against are the jacks and tens and then the ace king right let's say that they're mm -hmm. three betting ace queen sometimes too and that we win against it often enough so just to keep things simple so if we're saying we're going to play perfectly on flops that have an ace or a king on them then we're also letting our opponents play perfectly on flops that have an ace or a king on them because the hands that we're beating, jacks and tens, they're going to fold. And the hands that we were hoping to win the flip against, ace king, they're going to fold when there's not an ace or a king on the board and they're going to call when there is an ace or a king on the board, right? So mm -hmm. now we're never going to bet in those circumstances, I guess, is the argument. So we're just going to not pay off ace king when an ace or a king comes. And I guess we're giving up the value that we would get from jacks and tens because, again, we're not going to bet. So I guess we get to showdown against... So help me figure this out, Keith. So let's say our opponent has jacks. Let's say the board's, you know, six, seven, ten, or something like that. They're probably going to stack off if they're at an SPR where we're going to stack off with queens. Mm -hmm. So we do get their stack on those boards. Uh, if the flop comes an ace, if we're not stacking off with queens, I think they're probably also not stacking off with jacks, right? Like probably we're just checking that down, I guess, at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to think about... Uh pre-flop if we made that call what's it what is uh villain's three betting range he said it's a tight player right how tight he was playing around with him being like jacks plus and ace king or tens plus and ace king not much else uh he did yeah. look at some other spots where there's an ace four suited ace five suited um but again he was really looking in the context of when there's an ace on the flop, how bad our equity is against that yeah. range. Pretty bad. Yeah, definitely it yeah. is. It it really is. So, so we so definitely, but flop, like, so I we definitely that... don't want to see an ace, but like, does that mean yeah. that we shouldn't be shoving pre-flop? Talk so yeah, continue that thought, sorry. Yeah, it's uh well, first of all, sizing is 37 big blinds. The only four bet is a shove. Right. 37 big blinds. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and if we shove, how much fold equity have we got? Do you, when you consider that he's playing jacks plus ace king. Right. For his three bet raise, he's not even playing ace queen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How much fold equity have we really got on a four bet jam? Yeah, very little. Jacks. Yeah. And let's just to keep the math easy, let's give him tens plus because then he's okay. got two under pairs and two over pairs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so maybe jacks and tens. Yeah. So uh the the jam there is not great, you know, because he's we our full equity is not much. And uh right. most of the combos that villain's gonna have is gonna be his ace kings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That he's going to so call do you think, with. Which, which I expect he's going to call with. Yeah. Um, so that's, but that kind of gets at the root of it for me. Because if I think that most of our opponent's combos are ace-king. Yeah. We are slightly ahead of ace-king. So yeah. it's, it's good for our equity. You know, it's better than our equity. We'd rather have him call with a bunch of ace-king than just with aces and kings, right? Um. And if if those are most of the combos that get to the flop, then I feel like if they're only going to... So let's say the flop comes jack high and we've got queens again, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to lose to all the 
over pairs anyway, because we're going to lose to aces and kings anyway. Yep. Um, but what we've done is we've given ace king a chance to not pay us off. Whereas yeah. if we made him call preflop, then every time the board does not run out an ace or a king, we win the whole stack there, right? Yep. So we're kind of like removing our ability to get paid by the worst hands. Yeah. By, by by getting to the flop, by seeing the flop. Mm -hmm. Just like with up. tens and jacks, like if they would call the shove, and I guess that's one of the arguments is would they call the shove? But if they would call the shove, then again, they're only going to put their money in good post flop. And we could have gotten them to put their money in bad. So I, I guess that's the question yeah. I have is like, how valuable is it to get the hands that are behind you to get the money in bad? Because the hands that are better than you, you're going to still get the money in bad when it's a jack high flop. You're still going to get stacked when they've got aces or kings because you're 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 going on that flop. And you're still going to lose to aces and kings. So it makes me feel like we're kind of like free rolling our ace king opponents and our tens and jack opponents by letting them see a flop when we've got queens. Yep. So yeah, we're know. and uh we're not folding ace king out with the with the four bet. We're obviously not folding out aces and kings. Right. So I mean, We're I holding guess... them out of their equity if they have jacks and tens and anything else that they would three bet with if we but we've just listed it all. That's the thing with playing against a tight player, eh? Yeah. It's, it's uh uh four bet doesn't have a whole lot of fold equity. Right. Not three bet yes, because the three bets are so fold. tight. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. Yeah. Right, that's well, a some... good question. Yeah, something to think about. I guess it depends on and if and it's a it's a disaster if they are folding out ace king. Yeah. We definitely don't want that. If we're shoving queens, we don't want them to fold ace king. Um right. because then they're only continuing with aces and kings, and that sucks. So we don't want to take an action that they're gonna perf play perfectly against. So but yeah, getting to the flop is also kind of giving them an opportunity to to make good decisions with those tough decision hands you know like having aces there just aren't that many difficult decisions <laughs> so we yeah. don't have to worry about how they're going to play aces because i'm not sure we can really affect that very much um and kings are pretty close to that so yeah it's this weird spot when what you what want, position were we in what what position we is hero? Position. Uh, position? I don't remember exactly. He didn't say it, but uh, let's let's say probably like the cutoff or, or the hijack or something like that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, why don't you load up some of our monkey systems off table tools? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Share. Here we go. Good old range trainer pro. Yep. Now I've got it set up at for forty big blinds, which thirty seven okay. rounds off to. Yep. And uh we're in the cutoff versus a big blind three bet. Yep. Looks good. And this is saying to jam our queens. Mm hmm But the uh big blind three bet was done with a game theory optimal range. Right. And we're saying our opponent is probably tighter than that. Yeah. So um why don't you show, can you show me the, um, I love this program, by the way. Can you show me what the big blinds three betting range is? Yeah. Here. Okay, go to 40. Cut off against big blinds in the big blind. Uh... See a big blind oh, wait a minute. Versus... No, this is for single action. I'm sorry. I I, I went uh, yeah. No, that's so, right, I think, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, big blind big versus... blind versus cutoff 
open raise. Yeah, sure. Let's take a look at that. Yeah. yeah, so they've got a much wider three betting range, ace jack suited plus um some ace ten plus uh mixed tens plus yeah. Yeah. and then some shoves even that uh that we're not talking about in this particular variant. But yeah, a lot of um a lot of some kind of blocker. So you can see a range like this, which I think is the point you're making, Keith, has hands like 10-7 off, king, yeah. queen eight off, jack nine off ace four off they're all folding to our four bed and yeah. they were never in that original uh opening uh three bedding range that we were talking about so here queens makes total sense as a shove uh because yep. they're folding out a lot and um and you can also pick up a pretty good pot i guess that's the other thing we're not talking about is when they do fold, yeah, it would be nice if when you had queens, if they called with jacks and tens all the time. But even when they don't, you're still picking up a pretty good pot now. Yeah. You've taken, you know, eight big blinds out of their stack or something like that, plus the two and a yeah. half that were in the pot originally, which is about a third of our stack, a quarter of our stack that we've added. So that's pretty good. Um yeah, about the only other true. thing would be to run this scenario in GTO Plus. And that's, you know, we, we could do that during this call, but it's kind of yeah, time consuming. Yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and we could node lock the ranges that we'd want our opponent to be three betting and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something we can do off the felt, a great way to prepare as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is good. You can kind of see how, um, I'll stop this. You can see how the uh, wider opening, the wider three betting range there has a lot more room, a lot more hands that uh, that we can get folds out of. So I like that. Um, <clears throat> so another hand uh, that we were looking at in this play, this is from a live play series that Ryan was playing. This one I liked a lot. Uh, we were defending uh, an open from, we're in the big blind and it's a min open from middle position. We defend six, nine off suit. And um, we end up in a spot where I think it goes queen six four. They we check, they bet, we call. Um, and you know, these pros they're so good at maximizing the EV that they get from these kind of hands like this that they can comfortably complete the big blind to a defend it to a min raise with a huge portion of their range, including some yeah. hands that a lot of us would not feel comfortable playing out of position like six, nine offsuit. That doesn't jump out to me as like a very good hand, but um, yep. it's getting against a min raise with antis in play. You're actually getting really good odds to close the action and, and play a hand, even though you'll be out of position. Um, Cause when you make a pair, you're, just going to be ahead of your opponent a lot. It's hard to make pairs. Uh, yeah. But you have to play poker post-flop, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. Out of position. <laughs> Out of position with a weak hand. Um, yep. So And with range, with a capped range, whereas your opponent has uh, an uncapped range. So it's, it's going to be hard to do. And I think that's why for a lot of recreational players, it makes total sense to just fold these hands and you're not going to get as much EV out of them post-flop as some of these pros and regulars are anyway. So you're not giving up that much by letting it go. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that was really cool about this was um, Ryan had picked up a tell earlier in the session where uh, this player had bet out in a particular way where they, they, were, they were betting 15,000. So they had three 5,000 chips and in other bets, they'd just kind of taken them off their stack and placed them in the middle and slid them across. But in this one time, he'd taken the three chips and just kind of like helicoptered them in a little bit, just like mm -hmm. spun them out and dropped them in a different motion. And when that hand went to showdown, or he got raised and folded or something like that, and, and Ryan noted away in his file that uh, this player had made this different action when putting chips in the middle and that it was a weak holding when he did so so then an hour later this hand comes up here we're defending six nine offsuit and we end up with we ended up calling check calling flop check calling turn 
on uh, queen six four, and I think the turn was a jack, mm -hmm. or the turn was a was a ten. So at this point, we're, when we check call the turn, it's with third pair, and uh, no back doors and nothing like that. And then the river comes another over card a jack I think, and we check again, and the player does the same move where they kind of helicopter the chips in from above. It does seem like it's a little more sort of confident, but we've, we're reading it as weakness based on the previous action. So this is the thing that I wanted to, to bring up because uh, Kim Kilroy has talked about this a few times. This is something that uh, uh, Ryan LaPlante talks about in his training videos from time to time. When you're playing live, you've got time to make a decision and you've got real human people in front of you who are capable of giving off information mm -hmm. so use it um especially in this in this spot i think uh i don't know if it was for his tournament life or not but it was like a pretty big bet and it was obviously a big decision so one thing ryan has talked about in the past is you know you don't have to like stare down your opponent but kind of let them know that you're paying attention and thinking and see how they respond. And you you can ask them questions and you can try and elicit a response of some kind. But what really does it for Ryan is he says he pays attention to their pulse and that a lot of players will remain excited about a hand for two minutes, whether they're bluffing or playing for value. It's exciting, whether you're bluffing or you're playing for value. You're in a pod. You're anxious. You're not sure how things could go. But after two minutes, a lot of players that have a value hand kind of relax a little more, and their pulse slows. Whereas players that are bluffing tend to still be kind of anxious, and their their pulse continues to, to race. So he said... He was thinking about this for about two to three minutes. And at three minutes, he saw that the guy's pulse was still racing, was still going fast. And so he was like 95% sure that his six was good. Um, like very, very, very sure that his six was good. So he called and rolled it over as the winner. And uh, the other guy had a, a busted straight draw. And it's true, he he mm -hmm. he'd been bluffing. And it made it was a good play by him too. Like it made sense from the villain's point of view. He'd had an open entered on the flop, uh, bricked the turn, bricked the river, just continued. You know, he's got the top pair there often enough or something like that. Um, it wasn't like a crazy play. He wasn't out of line. I think he picked good sizing. But even despite all that, Ryan was able to deduce from the, the way that he put chips in the middle and the fact that he was still racing that pulse after two minutes that's what made him put the call in there um that and the play was conducive to the game action was congruent with it because it was either value or a bluff yes because that's yeah. what i that's what i try to look for is when a mannerism or some kind of physical tell like that is congruent with the game action mm -hmm. if they're not congruent then it's you don't have a live read that's just my policy yeah. If they are congruent, then you you're looking at a live read. Yeah, good point. Because if yeah. if if it doesn't, if the action doesn't tell a good story, then uh um the live read shouldn't be as important, right? Is that what you're saying? Because you can kind of trust the action better. Yeah. Or you know that yeah, on the on, on the river, it's just I guess it could go either way. His big bet could go either way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if it had been a small bet, I would have been more skeptical. Ryan did it on a big bet. So yes. Yeah, yeah I don't know well, that that's I could, could pull that one off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On the turn, a live read is uh if you see game action congruent with uh physical mannerism that uh indicates he wants to play a big pot mm -hmm. or it indicates he doesn't want to play a big pot. And either way, you disappoint him. Right. But, <laughs> yeah, but disappointing other... people is a big part <laughs> yeah. of poker. Yeah. On the river, um, I suppose it's the same way. I never really gave it much thought. 
you know, I usually it's for me it's the math. Yep. Which is generally, you know, and I guess the interesting thing about that, of course, is, uh, you know, the river is the only time that equity completely, uh, yeah. uh, what's the word, what polarizes from zero to yeah. 100, right? That's the only time that you can't have any uh, draws coming in or any fluky two outers or one outers, you know, yeah. all that's already happened. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's why he's a... The millionaire and i'm not that's right that's right <laughs> and it just goes to show what these players are you know these pro players what they're looking for and what they're factoring in um because yeah. i think according to the theory if you just look at that combinatorically like you should be ditching that six uh yeah at, on the turn or on the river but um he trusted that read he had he had a, he yeah. had a and having two different data points too, I think, made him feel more comfortable about it too. Because it was not only the pulse, but also the mannerism yeah. by which you, by which he put the chips in. Yeah, so. I have a hard time even picking up the pulse. I try yeah, to look at the. Too. I try. I, have, I try to look at the breathing. The pulse yep. is kind of a hard thing to pick up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people. Um, you can sometimes you can see it on their wrist. Mm. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you can. You have to see it on their neck on their mm -hmm. throat there's those are the only two places i've seen it kind of reliably some people have like uh a f here like in the temple sometimes you can uh -huh. see someone's pulse up in their temple um but yeah and, and you can see all these european pros wearing scarves you know 10 yeah. years ago or so to kind of take that take that away um and you know I, i'm kind of interested to see how this develops if people are still wearing masks in in live poker rooms and other ways of kind of like, hardly at all yeah they're, they're not wearing masks hardly at all this year mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year they were wearing them a lot this year yep. no because you gotta figure that's you know preventing you from giving away some information right just like sunglasses yeah. or a hat yeah um it's just less available real estate for people to pick up tells yeah but yeah. uh yeah I find it hard to be social though. Having the mask on makes it harder for me to engage yeah. with people. I just, just don't like it. After a while, I start to smell my breath. <laughs> maybe, you know, last year, maybe I should have brought mints along or something. There you go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this year, it doesn't matter. Hardly anybody's doing it. <laughs> uh, all right. So here we got another spot where. Um... Uh, he was talking about folding kings pre-flop. That's kind of kind of tied into this whole tell thing as well, and like playing predictable ranges. Um, you, he's mentioned a couple spots where he folded kings pre-flop uh, based on hand re based on like player player reading. So that one of them was in a spot where, and this is why it's so important that you pay attention to hands that other players are playing that go to showdown in particular. Um, this player had called a pre-flop action and then uh, they'd had a nut flush draw on the flop and then the turn had given them not only the nut flush draw but also an open-ended straight draw or something or no, a, a gut shot straight draw or something like that and then uh, at the river I don't remember exactly how how the betting went but they'd gone to showdown and so and it had king queen of hearts or something like that. And so uh, uh, Ryan had noted that when they had these really strong draws post flop, they hadn't raised at all. They hadn't put another penny into the pot, even mm -hmm. with all this uh, equity. And that that kind of made him think that they were a more conservative player, a make a hand player and not like a pushing your edges player. Yeah. And um, so he had Kings uh, in, in, in a, a few orbits later against this player. And I guess they hadn't, they must also have not made any three bets pre-flop, but um, uh, he had Kings opened to two and a half big blinds or something like that. And uh, this player three bet to five big blinds and he said he said 
He said, like, you know, I actually considered just folding right there, but I was actually getting the right odds to set mine <laughs> with kings. So that's what he ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and I think the flop was uh, seven, uh, nine high or something like that. And they put a quarter pot bet out and he just folded face up um, on, on top of it. And he said it really rattled the other player um, because they had aces. Uh -huh. And it, you know, they were like, well, what did I do wrong? Like, how does this guy not at least give me one bet here with kings on, you know, four, six, nine or something like that when I put a quarter pot bet in with aces? And, uh, and he was just like, well, I just, you know, knew you had aces, didn't make a set. So what what are you gonna do? It was an easy fall. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Yeah, so, sometimes their the the opponent's range is exactly aces. It's true. It's true. Yep. Little old uh, lady who hasn't played a hand in an hour, all of a sudden right. three bets. Yeah, exactly. Those exactly. kings are not looking very good. I've folded queens pre flop at tons of tons of times. Uh, yeah. against different action from different players. I think I folded Kings online a couple times. I don't know if I've ever folded them uh, pre-flop live uh, to one action is what I'm saying. Yeah. But um, yeah, maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be good enough. <laughs> yeah. That's a tough one. What about you? Yeah. Have you ever folded, folded Kings live? Uh, no. No, no, I've never done it. No. Um I don't think I've ever bet against that little lady type player though either. Yeah. Not when they Not, were three betting and you had kings. Yeah. Now when I've been a satellite, I've folded aces. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 And that's the example that I think, you know, helps illustrate that point. Um, where it's just the cost of being wrong is much greater than the reward of being right. Yeah. Um, so. And then they talk about kind of the importance of looking left in spots like that and just seeing, like, and, you know, just sizing up your opponent, I guess, is what they really mean. And, like, how excited are they? Are they, have they been leaning back in their chair the whole time? And now all of a sudden they're, like, leaning forward and looking intently around yeah. and, you know, oh, that, now that you mentioned that leading thing, you just jogged a memory of mine from yeah, last share weekend. It, share it. And that, yeah, the the uh, player to my right uh, was um, when he didn't have it. I mean, he his usual posture was to have his hands on the rail of the table, leaning forward. When he was at a hand and a card came out on the board and he didn't have it, he sat back. Hmm. So I folded a pretty decent hand against him when he didn't sit back because he had it. And makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I was right or not, or not, but uh, that was a very, very easy live read. Yep. The leaning back. That's great, read. man. I mean, yeah. Think about think about you know when we're all kind of playing good cards against each other and good poker against each other. We're trading edges, you know. We're Mac. We're hitting yeah. the equity that we deserve in pots and things like that. But when you can just make a read like that and and make a, a an exploitative fold or an exploitative call or an exploitative raise or something like that, mm -hmm. um, boy, that's that's like printing money. That, that's gold. Yeah. That's gold, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've seen guys who check their cards early pre-flop and then uh, they hold the cards up off the table to make it easier to toss them in. Yep. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, if I had one, a good player, normally a good player who had picked up a bad habit sitting in my left in Milwaukee a few years ago. I played a lot of cutoffs as if it was the button. Yes, that's the best way to think about it too. Yeah. Um and I see that all the time. And, you know, they've got the cards between their two fingers. They're just like holding it off the table a bit. They're just kind of waiting to flick, make that flick. Yeah. In. Yeah. 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 That holding cards up off the table is more common than you might think. Yeah. And it really makes a big difference. If you think about, you know, if you're in the cutoff, what your opening range is in the cutoff versus your open range in the button. If you know you're going to get the button twice in orbit, like you should mm -hmm. be 
factoring that in because that's a that's very a big profitable deal. position. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's just a lesson for your table manners, if you will. Don't right. check your cards until it's your turn. It's true. It's true. And then just, you know, be prepared when you are checking your cards because everyone's going to be looking at you then. Just do though do that in a methodical way that's not yeah. uh, putting private information out there in the public eye. Um, but it's true. You can't be read if you don't know what, what cards you have. And that, you know, the the way people hold their cards, that's, that's true post-flop too. I was in the hand a few weeks ago at a place here near Toronto. And um, there was a short stack in the small blind and I was in the big blind. And someone who had me covered was in late position. And uh, the flop was like ace, jack, seven. Mm -hmm. And I had called a pre-flop raise. And I had ace, five suited. Chose not to three bet with it this time because the stack size, the guy to my right. So the short stack shoves. And I don't know what the open raiser has, but if he has an ace, it's better than mine a lot of the time. And uh, I was kind of deciding whether to call or shove or uh, fold because this short stack player was all in. I didn't have to worry about them, them anymore. And I just, well, while I was thinking about it, I noticed that the guy, the only other player in the hand, had shifted his two cards into his hand. And it wasn't like I knew he was going to fold, but it was the posture that he'd taken pre-flop in earlier hands when he was getting ready to fold his cards in and so i was able to i so i called because i i sensed that he was going to fold and he did um and that and so i i picked up the pot and didn't have to worry about anybody having um a better ace and it was you know it factored into my decision making just looking to mm -hmm. the players left in the hand seeing how they're acting what they're paying attention to like you say, Keith, how they're holding their cards, you know, that can yep. make a big difference. Sometimes even the look on their face when they're even trying to have a poker face. Yes, that's you right. Know, if, if you could, if you can kind of sense that cat about to pounce on a mouse, look. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It should raise a red flag. That's right. Yeah, I love that. It's true. Um, Because ultimately, poker is a game of the player like playing the player trying mm -hmm. to make worse uh trying to make your opponent make worse mistakes than yours and um we lean on strategies to kind of give us a default where we're not going to make mm -hmm. too many big mistakes ourselves but in order to exploit the mistakes that our opponents are making we really have to deviate from those strategies enough to you know to play this one hand against this one opponent this this one time in the way that we think is is going to be the most profitable for us. Um, which is one of the things I think makes poker great, right? It's that great yeah. mix of uh, short-term luck and long-term skill and, you know, big picture strategy, but hand-by-hand -hand exploitation. It's just, it's a beautiful, elegant game. Yeah. Yep, it's a well, the other hand, uh, so I say what? A microcosm of life in general. Oh, it really is. It truly, truly is. Uh, it truly is. Um. A couple of the other hands were very similar concepts. Uh, one about sort of playing your hand versus playing your range, uh, which we talked about a little earlier. And another one was a, um, a queen's hand uh, where given the action, it, it felt like a, a fold to Ryan and it turned out to be correct. Uh, so I don't think we're going to benefit too much from going over that. But um, I'll just re remind our listeners, we do this every month and if you're a Rec Poker Premium member, every month on the first day of the month, we release a one-hour training video that's normally only available to paying uh, members at Learn Pro Poker, but you can get it as part of your premium membership here, along with other amazing videos on the uh, every Saturday, we release a new training video from one of our learning partners, uh, some great names out there, some great poker minds out there, uh, so go and get a piece of that. And uh, so my thank you to Ryan LaPlante and Learn Pro Poker. And uh, to Keith Brandt, Monkey System, for coming in here and talking poker with me in the study group. Um, so Keith, you have a good weekend with what's left of it. And uh, all you watchers and listeners at home, we'll catch up sometime soon, I hope. See you later. All right.